That's not her. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> good morning, good morning. How you doing, guys? I just made it in time again this morning. Lots and lots of preparation today. Lots of preparation. Rainy, another, another rainy, rainy, rainy morning. It's just pouring down day after day after day. That's what you get with the rainy season. Our American friends, I guess, they're still on their long weekend, are they? If the country's surviving, no idea. Or are they finished now? It's Monday here. Sunday over there. I guess it's a long weekend for there, yeah. Damp UK as well, yeah. End of the world. What's this? Oh, this is just fixing. I know the, this is the chibi block. Printing is going on apace. Ray Chan has finished her first batch. Amy San's working in her batch. And they've asked me for a couple of small block you know, adjustments, which I did last night. Just a couple of places where it was a bit too thin. I had, and not too, the holes, the gaps were a bit too thin to open them up a little bit. When the gaps are a bit too thin, pigment sticks inside. So it was just a bit of fixing for them. Okay, we have a ton of stuff here this morning. A ton of stuff. Step one, of course, we have some work. Mainly, I'm going to be working this morning carving. There are a bunch of things to talk about and show. I know some blocks arrived from Kawasaki-san, our carver in Kobe. That might be interesting to have a look at. We have no brand new show and tell this afternoon, but those blocks that arrived the other day, I have now printed them. We've had a look at what they are, and there's some interesting stuff on them. So towards the end of the stream here today, we can pull out those black blocks again, and now you can see what they are, what they are for. Any printers working today? As it happens, no, they were here over the weekend. Yesterday, Aimi San and Shikao San were upstairs. Today, there's no yellow dots on the, uh, on the fridge door. I'm here by myself today. So no paper today, no. I was chatting to, with Kawai San, Mr. K, on the phone the other day. And he's thinking now he might come back and start printing here instead of being at home. But uh, I think he was thinking about it until he looked outside and saw the rain, but whatever. His concern was the trains, you know, if the trains were too crowded and uh, too, uh, you know, quote, unquote, dangerous, but uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, we're on the fingers. So he may be coming back to do work, uh, do work here. And Dei Chan, she's doing most of her work at home these days. She just lives a few minutes walk away, but uh, she, she finds it more comfortable. Chon San is there, her partner, and they work, uh, they work together. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. Do we get wet often in July in Tokyo? Yes, yes, yes. What are the white cars with blue stripes and light on top? White car, blue stripe. Not sure, it's not a police car. Police cars are white and black. It might be a gas company or something, one of their cars. I don't know. It's not a police car. No, I don't know. Did one just go by just now? White car with a blue stripe. White car with a blue stripe. I don't recognize any such thing. No idea. One blue stripe down the side driving fast. Like I said, maybe it could be like a gas company or electric company, stuff like this. You know, they've got their maintenance cars and every now and then, every now and then they have to get going somewhere quickly. It's a tad windy and the, the, the oyster shack, he's put out his empty garbage, oh no, he put out his full garbage last night. They were empty during the night. Now they're, they're uh, plastic buckets, which are, are light, and the wind is tossing them around. Taxis are black here, for the most part. Taxis are black. There are very, very few uh, mustard color taxis, but for the most part, they're black. Okay, let's get some work done. Oh, 
this also. So something else funny today. Uh, yeah, I got yeah, to work first. I got to do some work here, you know. But remind me later about the T-shirt. Remind me about the T-shirt. We got our new, we get new T-shirts every year from the local uh, business association. And uh, we got our two new T-shirts yesterday. So remind me about those. What's funny about T-shirts? <laughs> Actually, John might remember from last year. Every time I hear a car, I'm going to look up to see if it's a white car with a blue stripe on the side. <laughs> no. You guys are talking too much. I can't catch this. So speaking about the catching the stream, you know, speaking about catching the stream, I know, not yesterday, when was it? Today's Monday, so last one must have been Saturday. Sometime over the weekend, I did. I had a look through. I usually do it while I'm eating my lunch, but uh, whatever. I looked through it. And uh, I read the, the chat from last, uh, the last stream. I can't time it with the, with the video, of course. I'm not going to watch the whole 90 minutes just so that I get the chat to line up with the video. But just watching the chat, what was that about? What was that about? You know, I can't remember. All I can see is your side of the conversation. But anyway, whatever. So I'm reading this thing from Saturday, and I, I realize that one of our members here has a real problem. <laughs> and the other, the other chat members mentioned this, too. They said... Uh, they said that, you know, Andy, you have a problem. <laughs> whatever. Is she here today or not yet or whatever? It was funny. You know? <laughs> I also, something I hadn't realized in general, you know, that uh, reading that thing from, from last Saturday, that it seems there are lots and lots of uh, new people these days. There's lots of names I don't recognize, handles I don't recognize, and there's lots of conversation where somebody's dropped in and like, what's going on? And you guys have been uh, explaining to these people what's going on. There's much more of that than I had realized. And then looking at the counts, I guess on Saturday, there was something like a couple, at one point, there was a couple hundred people watching this thing, you know. I have really, really, really mixed feelings about that. You know. It's nice to think that this is interesting and, and people are going to look at it and stuff like that. But I really, really hope this doesn't get, uh, get much different from what it is now, you know.
But I think what will happen, or what, what probably has been happening, is any number of people will, uh, will drop by and see it once, but very, very few people will come and watch this uh, on a regular basis, you know. For most normal people, this is, you know, it's kind of, oh, that's nice to have seen that, to see a few minutes' work of a carver carving or something, but it's not something they're going to, uh, going to be involved with on an extended basis, you know. Normal people, right? I say that not in any, any sarcastic sense, just in a, in a, you know, a common sense thing, of course. You know. It's interesting to see it. Oh, that's cool. Wow, such a thing exists. And then, you know, you move on and do something else. You know. Any number of times when I see this or think about this or read that chat, there's an old joke that I heard or read a billion years ago. I know, my parents in the house used to have, uh, they didn't subscribe to it. You know, there's a magazine called Reader's Digest. They didn't subscribe to it, but they, uh, they used to get what they call what, the condensed books or something. That, that publishing company put out different magazines and condensed books and stuff. So in our house when I was a kid, and I'm talking about like when I was like 8, 10, 12, and stuff like that, there were various magazines and books from that, that company, and they always had joke columns in them, like today's best puns or today's favorite jokes or whatever, whatever. It was a lighthearted kind of thing. And I remember reading those things all the time, and one sp couple of specific jokes I remember. I can't tell you the joke all that well, but the, the gist of the thing was it was in the old days, whenever there was a construction project, they'd put the hoarding around it in the city and guys in there are digging a hole. And the hoarding, and I remember this actually, the hoarding used to have holes so that people from outside could sort of see inside what's going on. Wow, cool, the guys in there are digging and, and building bricks and stuff like this. And the joke was, the guy's looking through one of these holes at the workers inside and a friend comes by and says, look at this, that guy down there, He's just been, he hasn't done a stroke of work all day long. All the people around him are busy, 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 but that guy down there hasn't done a stroke of work all day long. And his friend says, how do you know? He says, I've stood here watching him. And I keep remembering that, thinking about this stream, you know, and you guys who are visiting it. You know. All in fun, but just, you know, Dave just realizes he's probably told the same story 500 times already, but whatever. Yeah, 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 John, <laughs> showing your age, John, <laughs> yes. So, laughter, the best medicine, that's it, that's it, that's it, exactly. I might, if I, I'm actually, could you read that now? Would any of those things be funny? I mean, when I remember reading it, I just read it and read it and put it aside and read it. I don't remember laughing or anything, but you read those things and nobody laughed, I guess, I don't know.
Yeah, 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 interesting. Well, of its era. Does it still exist? I don't remember. I, I mean, of course, I have no idea. It was, uh, this would be, I'm talking about the 1950s moving into the 1960s, you know. Actually, the one that was more important in our house uh, than that, there was, there was three then. Reader's Digest was in and around sometimes. Uh, and then uh, Life magazine. They didn't have Life magazine, but what the, the same organization published, and these were vividly important part of our life. There was like the Life Nature Library, the Life Science Library, and stuff like this. And I think they were marketed in supermarkets. Like one week you would get number one, and the next week you'd get number two or something. Or I don't know, or was that encyclopedias? Anyway, I don't remember, but on, on the bookshelves at home, we had these sets. And I tell you, me and my brother, we wore them out. And if it's possible to wear out a page by reading it enough times and the letters disappear, then we wore those books out. The Life Nature Library, the Life Science Library. Were there more? I don't remember. I don't know, my, my parents must have got them for us like Christmas present or whatever, or just, just as part of a normal course of life. And man, that was such a big deal for us. I'd love to browse those again. They're probably still around. I guess every used bookstore probably has mountains of them because so many must have been sold back then. This part of the work here right now, where you've got lots of little tiny lines bumping up against each other, this is part of the work that becomes, uh, <laughs> excuse me, becomes part of the detective story later on. Quite a lot of times we get these Meiji era books, you know, the Kuchie type stuff, the Meiji era books and illustrations. And that was an era when they were having to transition from carved stuff to things produced by photography and metal plates and things like that. We've got a bunch of books in the collection that have been hard to actually tell. Was that carved or was that from a metal plate made from brushwork? And some of those tiny postcard prints, for example, that, that, that we've looked at before, it's really, really hard to tell from just looking at the print. Was that a carved wood block or was there a, a metal plate involved? And with the Yoshida prints, for example, all through the, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s and stuff, the Yoshida prints are actually made with metal key blocks, not carved key blocks. And looking at the old prints, there's a few things you can look at under the microscope to try and help you decide how they were done. And this corner I'm carving right now is one of the places you look for. You get a place like this. There's this boy's finger. I don't know how much, how big you're seeing here. There's this boy's finger, before I scratch this thing, or a pencil. Oh, pencil's too big. The boy's finger comes along as a line, or a few lines. Then there's lines, chuk, 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 bumping into that line. Now, if this thing, the original for this, if you draw the finger, and then draw those other lines, and then send it off for photographic reproduction, shrinking, metal plate, bang, bang, bang. The finger is there, and the lines are there. But if that had been prepared as a drawing, then pasted on a block and carved, it's very, very, very common that while the carver is carving that one line, out of all the little lines, chuk, 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 whoop, pop, whoop, he popped out the finger a little bit right there. And the faster you work, the more likely it is that you're going to pop out here and there a tiny little bit of this. Now, as it happens today, I've been doing this carefully. The finger is still there. 
those small lines are there, so far so good. I presume I can get through this, so far so good. But the more of this work there is, and sometimes you see it at the hair lines or the edge of the line, anytime you've got a long line with small lines, chuk, 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 later on, under the microscope, you can see a little break. One of those lines has been popped with the knives crossed. And as soon as you see that, you know that's not a photographic block. There's the touch of the knife making a tiny slip up. And we got lots of the stuff upstairs, the couche or whatever. You see all these little tiny, uh, what are they called? Not hints. I know. It's little bits of evidence that tell you that it could only have been done from a knife. That could not have been done through photographic methods. And there's, there's clues the other way, too, that shows you, ah, oh, that's a photograph, that's not a knife. So maybe what I should do is pop out part of his finger here by mistake, and the future researchers will tell, ah, oh, that's right, Dave, he really did carve that. There it is. Look at the evidence there. Like there's anybody else on this planet that would know, but... Now you know the rest of the story. Right here, Nick. If I came up here a tiny bit too far, that horizontal piece of wood on the finger pops out. So many topics for David's Choice videos. Nay, nee, just will never, ever, 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 ever get caught up to them all. But uh, can't be helped. can't catch all of this, so... <laughs> so Andy has showed up, has she? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Andy San. Andy San. I read the chat the other day. The other thing about this thing, the hairs on the brush like this too, is there's another bit of a, a bit of a paradox here. Carver wants to carve this as, you know, he wants to do a beautiful job. Neatly, cleanly, let's do as, as well as we can, show everybody how delicate we can carve. And yeah, this is a scrubbing brush that's being used to clean an inkstone. Now there's this scrubbing brush at the moment, is gah, 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 gah. it's not delicate hairlines of an UQA, you know, courtesan or whatever. So these things should not be all lined up and smooth and neat and delicate. This is a, a, a brush that's being used. And yet the carver wants to, let me show off and carve these delicately and carefully and neat and clean. And I don't want to carve one sideways. And yet the job itself demands that you do this a little bit messy. So is that my excuse or, you know? Okay, there we go. Stone finished. Oh no, let's clean up the hand. So.
Matthew Muller shop delivery? Yeah, seems so. No, next door. Ah, no, what it is. It's the little place next door to the kimono shop. It used to be Bar Emmy. She packed up and left, I don't know, is it a year ago now or somewhere? And it was empty for the longest time. Then somewhere around the end of last year, was it November or December, a bunch of people came in and gutted it. Jack Hammers took everything inside out, put up a temporary plywood wall on the front with a door, and then we saw people from like a planning company measuring and planning and measuring and planning. And it seemed that they were going to be opening some kind of a street food something or other in there. I didn't chat with the people directly. And then January, February came along and the world changed and the padlock was there and it hasn't been touched for February, March, April, May. It was just silence, nothing, just locked and padlocked. And a few days ago, there was a delivery, a little white van like this. They delivered a bunch of bags of, uh, of cement and uh, gravel and stuff. And a bunch of workmen went in there. I think I think what they must have been doing is they laid a floor. I didn't. I was busy here and I didn't see what they were doing. But uh, so it looks like it's come back to life. The project. The project for that empty shop, which had been uh, you know put aside for a while, has now come back to life. And this is this is the same truck that delivered those uh, that uh, gravel the other day. So here we are. There's going to be another business opening up on their other side, and. Of course, the joke, we're joking about it. It's, it's Korean hot dogs. It's, it's uh, whatever, Taiwan hot dogs or something. And we're going to have Korean hot dogs on the left and Taiwanese hot dogs on the right. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Who knows? Maybe it's one of the other woodblock print companies in town opening up. That would be cool. Oh, Karen, Karen, that white car with the blue stripe and the light on top, is that the, was that the Google car, the Street View car, do you think? Because it looks something like that. It's whitish color and it's got a cluster of things on the top. I don't know about a blue stripe. And they usually come by early in the morning. Remember, they've caught me before when I was sweeping out there. So this is about the time that they do come down. I wonder. We'll find out in a few weeks or whenever the pictures get updated. Okay, the boy, that boy, except for his face, these feet and arms are finished. Let's move on to another foot. Is boxwood easier to find than a good piece of cherry wood? No, from, for us, no, but I know boxwood too. The, to find a piece of boxwood this wide is next to impossible. I've had these for years, I didn't even know. Well over a decade we've had this wood in stock here. Finding boxwood this wide is stunningly, stunningly difficult. I know people doing the engraving, they use boxwood on the end grain and they laminate. They get smaller pieces and stick them together. For us working on the plank, we need a single wide piece. So I, don't, I have no recommendations, no, long, no knowledge, no nothing about boxwood. It is really difficult to find, difficult to prepare, difficult to use, and difficult to store. We've had lots of experience doing that. We used to make these boxwood blocks with about three, four, five millimeters thickness, same as you do with cherry. It doesn't work. There's so much strength in the wood, it pops and cracks and twists. I can't, I can't guide you in any way on that. I go going back and back. I can't catch this. I'll read it later again. Hey, hey. <laughs> Box 
when it's only a shrub. It's only a shrub anywhere, absolutely a shrub anywhere. And all Mikurajima is where ours comes from. The Brits who are doing it for their printing mostly get it from Turkey. Turkish boxwood is apparently really, really famous. And that's the thing, because it's only a, it's a slow growing, like camellia, it's a super slow growing shrub. Oh, we do have another hand. Let's do this. The other thing about boxwood, if anybody was thinking about trying it, I, know, I don't want to be pretentious here, but it's not really a good idea if you don't have too much experience. I know. Another main, main reason is that it's so hard to take care of it after. Normally, we'd cut our cherry blocks, and do some printing, and you know, just toss, not toss, but we put the block aside, dry it out, then throw it in the storeroom, pull it out later, and use it, print it, put it aside, dry it off, put it back in the storeroom. Boxwood really, really is super prone to split. If you just throw it in the storeroom and then came back the next summer or something, you'd find out in the winter it has probably split on you. So they can't just be left alone to take care of themselves like we do with the cherry blocks. The cherry blocks here, we don't seal them up or wrap them. In winter they get dry, in rainy season they soak up some water, they swell, in winter they dry. They just, that's part of their normal life. But boxwood stuff, if it gets too dry, and you're done. So you gotta take care of it like, like a guy would take care of a violin or something. You can't just assume that it's okay. With, with drying and, and moistening and stuff. So whatever, if you want to try it and play with it and tease it, that's okay, but you know, it's really, it's high maintenance stuff, I guess is what I'm saying. Really high maintenance stuff. We've lost lots of it, lots of it. I've had boxwood blocks, I'm gonna, I'll use you next year, and I can't just wait to use you next year, then get to the storehouse, and it's gone. And that's good news, bad news, as long as it died before I got a chance to use it, you know, it gives you early warning. That's another reason, too, the block, boxwood blocks we've prepared, we never, ever, ever, ever use them right after preparation. They go in and spend some time on the shelf, years on the shelf. This block, it's easily more than 10 years we've had in preparation. The theory being if it makes it through the first 10 years, we're probably okay.
coming along, eh? slowly but surely coming along. Violins and stuff, whatever, 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 whatever. You're building violence, so. <laughs> violence, nay, I never got into that. I made guitars, but never did violins. Thought about it. I got the book. What's it called? The famous, there's a famous book published when 18 something or other. Herring, Heron. Art and Craft of Making Violins. I got the book when I was a teenager. It's still on the bookshelf in Ome. It sits in there on the bookshelf in Ome. I forget what it's called, The Art and Craft of Making Violins. It's published in like the year dot. Dave thought about it. Over the years, he looked at it and thought about it. But get serious, you know, get serious. Now, how many toasts? One, two, three, four, five. Well, that was funny. Reading the chat the other day after, the, after the, this thing was over, reading Saturday's chat, where I was carving those little toes over here, struggling with one of the little toes, whatever. And I hadn't seen it at the time, but somebody, I guess somebody in watching the chat was a podiatrist. <laughs> enjoying, uh, enjoying the stream for a reason that I had never thought about, you know, so. Carving toes, and this guy's diagnosing them. This person is diagnosing them. You know, so.
stream times, I believe, are still listed on the uh, on the Twitch page. I, d I don't even know that the, the Twitch pages change so often. I should have a look more often and see if it's still up to date there. But there is a schedule, which I believe is accurate, listed on our, our Twitch our Twitch channel page or whatever it's called. We're three times a week still. It's hard to believe that when I first started it was six times a week and for the first week or so we did it twice. Once in the morning at the beginning of our day and once in the evening. I did it twice a day for six days a week. It was insane. Just insane. Uh, something else to mention too. I know in my e inbox, my unanswered pile of inbox, it's been, it's been bookkeeping, bookkeeping, bookkeeping. We're still involved in the the inventory and the preparation for the financial year and stuff like that. There's a mountain of unanswered things in the inbox. Some from people that really do need need replies. They've asked about things we've talked about on the stream and whatever. And somebody asked on the stream the other day. I don't think this is a person who watches live, so he'll probably see this recorded later during the day. I haven't answered the email yet. He asked about the, uh, the video camera through the trinocular and the fact that I brought this block back. He had thought, and maybe I said something like this a year ago, I can't remember, that when we put this block aside, I had put it aside because something like, next week we'll have a real good camera view through the tripod, tri tri binocular, and we'll be able to see it, so we'll save this for next week or something. I can't remember what I said. And then different work got in the way and this block just even just got put aside. So he asked me the other day, is the camera ready now? Is that why you're bringing this block back? No, the camera isn't ready. Long story short is I bought one. It's just in a box sitting up here. It's from the Raymer company, W-R-A-Y-M-E-R. -E and it was a turkey, an absolute turkey. I sent it back to them. They sent it back to me saying, tough luck, you bought it, it's yours. And I guess under the right circumstances and the right time and place, it works, maybe. It would not work for us. It turns out the light, and I knew this actually, when you, when you magnify stuff, you need more illumination. Our eyes accept a certain amount of lux and lumens per square, whatever, whatever, but when you focus down, 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 you've still got a full field of view, but the amount of light catching in the small area is much reduced. So yeah, microscopes and stuff need good illumination. This is, this is just a scientific x, y, and a square root of, of how much light is falling on a surface. And we have, I thought, here light, and we had a ring light. I put the ring light back around the lens, shining down, and it didn't work because the camera needed so much light to get the exposure and the frame rate. And the amount of light I had on this thing was enough to give it an exposure of like 1 30th of a second, which gave me a frame rate of like, 50, it was two or three frames per second at the end of the day. And that was their point. No, I'm sorry, your illumination is not strong enough. And I guess like you need the light of 10,000 suns shining on your work to be able to get a good video frame rate to match the one that they showed on their website where they sell the damn cameras. And it's probably in there in the small print. You know, you need 50,000 lumens per square centimeter or whatever it is, I don't know. So at the moment, that's not working. I have the camera, they won't take it back, but I don't have anywhere near the light to get that thing going. So at the moment, it's just whatever, I'm sorry, it'll come to life when it comes to life. You know. If there was, you know, somebody here like to fool around with these projects on the side so that they could get that organized while I was, you know, working, okay. But I just, I really, really have to avoid getting distracted by too much stuff, you know.
another person had sent a mail asking about uh, Tokuriki-san prints. Oh, that's our, uh, that's our garbage truck to show from the... When I was showing those on uh, Okuyama Gihachiro prints that we got at the auction last week, I had been trying to compare his work to Hasui and Yoshida and other Shinhanga artists. I guess I tossed off a comment on it. It's in between. It's in between Hasui at the top and that junk Kyoto tourist stuff that Tokuriki-san used to make down at the bottom. You know, I, I said something like that, whatever. And I, I obviously I painted the guy with a bit too much of a broad brush because uh, the person who had been listening sent me uh, some photographs of two or three Tokuriki prints that he had. And they're beautifully made, very, very nicely made. Quite similar, actually, to the, the Okuyama Gihachiro stuff. Clearly carved and printed by professionals. And Tokuriki was, was a really mixed guy. He did some completely by himself in the early days. Later, when he got onto the idea that tourists would buy this stuff, he hired carvers and printers to do stuff for him. He had some made, or Uchida used him for some designs that they produced. So his stuff is all over the map. And the two prints that this man showed in the email, they were really, really nicely made. They weren't junk schlock. I guess whatever word I used on the stream, I'm sorry. I, I was in my mind, I was thinking about sort of the lowest of the low that the guy used to make, you know. And it wasn't right to paint him with a single brush because he made all sorts of different kinds of stuff, you know. And some of it is quite attractive. You know? So that's an email waiting for me to reply to. And, uh, yeah. I have to be careful, you know, this, this person in email is taking my word as being a guru, and if David thinks this is no good, then I guess that's it, it's no good. And this was not the case, of course, you know. Toenails, more toenails. Okay, there's the big toe finished. Big toe, what's the name? Is there a name for it? I can't remember. Big toe. Oh, what are you guys say? You're on all kinds of stuff. Good, good, good. Uh, John Becker saying, uh, Tokuriki. This is my general impression, John, but actually, actually, for example, the two, the two pictures that came to my email, it's attractive stuff. He had sketched and prepared and prose, professional carving, professional printing. Also, Tokuriki, there's a thing about Tokuriki, you know, he's responsible. Like, you could argue the chain going back. He's responsible for me being here. That's white with a blue stripe. Karen? No. And all, there was a series of little books published in Japan in the 1940s and early 50s in Japanese. I think it was called the Bunka Living Series or something like this. I can't remember what the series name is. Like, and they were little tiny books, little, little, about half the size of a postcard, about 40 pages each. 
about tea ceremony flowers, this and this and this and this. And they did one on woodblock printmaking and carving, and a Sosaku type, modern stuff. And he was the person they asked to do it, and it was published. And they also prepared these books. This is the 1950s and early 60s. They prepared an English language version of these, which were spread out all over the world. And in England, a dude called David Stones ran across one of these. And in Canada, a dude called David Bull ran across one of these. And we gleaned and looked at it. And it said, there's the paste, and you try and do this. It wasn't a how-to manual, but it sort of had some information on how to do this. Not enough. It's really quite frustrating. I turned it upside down. How do you, oh my god, I can't, you know, whatever. But that was the initial technical inspiration that I had. I told you I saw some prints in a gallery. Let's try this. How can I find something? Tokuriki's little book I had, and I wore it out and wore it out and wore it out. And over in Britain, in I think it was in Lancashire, not Lancashire, maybe Lancashire, Dave Stones had got this book, and he did something about it. He flew over here. And this would have been, it's before my time. It's 19... 80, somewhere on there, I don't know. I came in 86, he's before me, maybe maybe even 10 years before me, 76. He came over here and went to Tokuriki, knocked on the door. And in Tokuriki's book, in the last page of this thing, it says something like, I hope you've enjoyed the book. If you've had more interest, whatever, you know, and you're in Japan, drop by and visit. He just said this at the end of the book. And David knocked on the door. And he ended up working for the guy. Tokuriki's got this workshop. They're printing all this stuff for the tourists. You want to work? Okay, whatever. Sit down. Go for it. And Dave spent, you'd have to talk to him, whatever, three, four, five, six years, whatever, sitting in one corner of the room, X hours a day, helping to print this tourist stuff. He's working as an English teacher with a student English visa, whatever, married a Japanese girl eventually in Kyoto. So both Dave Stones and me, we got a huge boost and a huge head start from Tokuriki-san. So I gotta be careful what I say about that, because he's long gone now. And I tell you, the amount of schlock that came out of the workshop was staggering. But yeah, there's, there's interesting stuff in there. Who's Dave Stones? Look it up, Google it. He's been in Japan. I, Dave Stones from Britain. It's a David from England with a scraggly beard, woodblock printmaker in Japan. That's me, right? No. Dave from Britain with a scraggly beard in Japan since the 1970s. That's Dave Stones. He's still here. He doesn't do this, but he's there. Google him up. Somebody can find the website. Cameron on the stream. I hope not. I hope he's doing bookkeeping. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, yes, here. See, Hoka, that is Cameron. Morning, sir. How you doing? I know you got the, I packaged back up the, the customer data files, right? This is just between me and Cameron. He sent me the customer data files over the weekend so I could do some of the bank reconciliations. The reconciliations are 90x percent finished, and I sent the information back. Yep, got it all. Remind me about the shirts. Crap, there's just too much going on today. It's the blocks from Kawasaki san. All right, the shirts, one minute, one minute. The shirts, it needs some Japanese explanation. Our street here, this is, these are the shirts of our merchants association for this street. It's Dok Dori, Dok, number, how you, see, you know how to count it in Japanese. Ichi ni san shigo doku. Doku is number six, so doku is six. And this used to be the sixth district. Around Sensoji, well, around, in any area, there was ku. Ichi ku ni ku. Ku meant district. Now it's a bigger, wider meaning. Tokyo has districts, they became cities. This is Taito ku, which was Taito district. It's now Taito city. Anyway, long story short, around Sensoji was Ichi ku ni ku. Ku san ku. It turned out that doku ku, and because of the way the word, your mouth works, they don't say doku ku, doku ku. They elide them, doku, doku. And it comes out just sounding like rock, as in rock and roll. And the funny thing is, doku was the entertainment district. It was the theaters and all that stuff and the strip clubs, whatever. So we are left over doku ku. And this street is doku dori, doku ku dori street the street of the 6th district. So our merchants association, somebody's got it. Cameron's got it. Doku Dori. Sai, doku no. So we have our merchants association. Doku. And the guy two doors down from me that runs the antique shop, they were, uh, he's the Fukukaicho. He's the assistant president to the vice president or whatever. They needed a logo and a whatever, whatever. So we are Doku Ku. So what would you use for your logo? 
And what has he done? And we have now this year's T-shirts, and we have, in Japanese, we have, it's okay, Asak, it's top to bottom, I know, I'm seeing it back to you. It's, it's Asak, Asa, Asakusa, Asaksa, Dokku, Dori. This is right, this is, I'm um, wrong way around. Is that a reflection? Asaksa, Dokku, Dori. It's, but on the front side, we have, of course, Dokku. Ku also is this, so we all walk around with 69 t-shirts. That is our logo here. And the, the guy who set it up, Ano Isamoto-san, I said, did you actually think about this a little bit? I know. He says, what do you mean? What should I think about? <laughs> <laughs> it works both ways, you know. Dorky Westerners put funny kanji on their t-shirts not knowing what it really means, and it works both ways. Japanese put dorky English on the t-shirts without knowing that some other things about it. Anyway, I've got these two t-shirts, and they were given to me by the... And this is interesting. I hadn't known about this. Cameron, have a look at this. On the, on the, on the sleeve, wow. it says, Corona Bastas. We're not Ghostbusters, we are Corona Busters. <laughs> it's cool, you know, it's fine. They are, these are people who are working hard to work on our community and build our community and keep it clean and get it all worked out. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not shooting at anybody here. I'm a member of this group and, uh, we're working hard, working hard to build our community here. So my new lime green 69 t-shirt. I think that's not, what is that? I think it's sewn, the red is sewn there, I think. Yeah, that lettering is sewing. Right. This is sewn on, John. It's on a thread. So I don't think it's printed. Yeah, it's sewn in to show. The other part was printed on the front. This part's sewn in. So I imagine it's just the Utel Illustrator, black, red, and the machine takes care of it, I would imagine. Actually, t-shirts these days, I think it's really changed. Now, I chatted with Jed about this the other day. He does some t-shirts on his website. And he said, man, the quality is stunning, stupendous. He gets t-shirts that are like 350 DPI resolution with his prints, and you can wash them 500 times, they just get better. It seems t-shirts are a big, big different story from what they used to be. Nissan Cherry, yeah, whatever. There's a million stories, of course, of that sort of thing, a million stories. It is noisy out there. Are we okay? Is the outside audio? Oh, we have rain on the camera. Let me move the camera in a little bit here. Excuse me, excuse me. I haven't had that one before. It's getting blustery. Really, yes, sir. I've had to pull the camera right inside. Sorry. All the times we've been doing this, I haven't had that before. Kumamoto, yeah, boy, oh boy, oh boy. The thing about that, though, you know, it's like it's your once in a hundred years stuff, you know, and that flood just, whatever, you saw the pictures in the video. 
But at the end of the day, we still have the same problem. We are building houses in a very deep river valley. And this is just telling us that we've been able to get away with it for a number of years, but we ain't gonna be able to get away with it for too much longer. And it's clearly what we should have been doing and what we need to do from now on, you know? Whatever. Don't build houses near rivers, says the guy who owns a house on a riverbank in Ome. Okay, what do we do? 904, okay, let me do a bit more work. It's okay, it's okay. Well, Kyushu gets it because they are the most tropical part of the country. I mean, other than Okinawa, I mean, they're the most tropical part of the, of the main country here. Did I bang the tripod? It's different. Is it blurry? Is it okay? The question about the houses near the rivers and stuff, you know, and in landslide zones and whatever. I think what we've done is just sort of everybody has known this, people, governments, whatever, but we've just thrown up our hands and said, whatever, what are you going to do? It can't be helped, you know. And whenever I hear that, I think about the place I used to live in Hamura. In, when I first moved to Japan, I moved to Hamura. It was a little, it's a the next, next town to Ome, and it was a town at that time. It became Hamara City later, but at that time it was a town. Real cool place, very nice, nice parks, library, all the stuff, friendly people. We get an apartment, reasonably cheap. Really cool place to live. It had two stations, Ozak Station, busy, 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 commercial, industrial, blah, blah. And it had Hamara Station, which was really struggling because one side of it, the west side of Hamara Station, had empty lots here and there, fenced off and fenced off, and the business district was dying. And the reason it was dying was City Hall had made a grand plan. What we'll do is instead of this ramshackle old places that are going to catch fire and burn down and back streets, fire engine can't get in, it's unacceptable to live like this, they made a grand plan for a plaza and wide streets and fireproof and all this kind of stuff and concrete construction. And they made it as a 50-year plan. Uh, what they did was, any time somebody died or a building was sold or whatever inside that group, it could only be rebuilt if it matched the shape and location and structure and whatever of the new grid pattern and the new this. And they were saying, your land, we're going to take this, we'll give you a piece over here, blah, blah. They made their plan. Now, I heard this, and it was ramshackle, because half the shops were empty, the people couldn't rebuild, granddad died, the kids couldn't resell the property. The whole district was frozen and covered with cobwebs and dying, and everybody's like, oh my god, oh my god. And now, I came here, I came here 36 years ago, it was ramshackle. Now, it's safe, clean, beautiful, bustling, everything's rip-roaring and good to go. Is some smart city hall or smart whatever or controllable city hall made their plan for we can't fix it in our generation but two generations down the road we know of a beautiful glorious society for them and they made their plan and stuck to it for 50 years so you hear that story you think okay we don't want people dying from floods anymore what are we going to do you know well maybe something like this. You, you make your plan for a new city over there. Don't allow rebuilding, reconstruction here. Make a deal where we'll pay you to move, whatever, you know. Make a plan. Think what it, life could be like. Make a plan and stick to it. 
Oh well, no, I'm just, I'm just gassing, I'm just making noise. But that example was there. Dave in 1986 said, you gotta be kidding me. These people have to sacrifice for like 50 years from now? What, you gotta be kidding me. Freedom loving Western Dave. And yet Dave now says, you know, oh, maybe that wasn't such a bad idea. <laughs> That really is, a, it is or was, I don't live there now, so I'm not hip on their current situation. It really was a very progressive little city. What they had done, it was one of the very, very, very few communities anywhere in this country that has zoning. They have a residential area, a commercial area, and an industrial area, and there's no houses in the industrial area and no factories in the residential area. And they could get away with this because they were a post-war new city. In the post-war baby boom era, the city, uh, Tokyo sort of expanded and expanded. And this new town had been set up out there. And because they were new and it was just all agricultural land and, and wasteland and scrubland being repurposed for a city, they could start with a clean slate. And the first generation of mayors and stuff back in whatever this was, 1940s, 50s, they had this vision that they could do a zoned city where you wouldn't have a factory in your neighborhood. You know? And it worked. Very, very rare in Japan because they had a clean start. There's never enough time for this stuff. 9-12. Oh, yeah. oh. 9-12. Okay. 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 We got a couple of things here. Let me quit three minutes early here because there ain't going to be enough time. There ain't going to be enough time. Okay, there's not much out there going on with the rain, so let's, uh, in fact, let's just, uh, no, let's just turn this off. And let's take this one and shrink it down a bit. Okay. Okay, a couple of things. The, the main show and tell today, this is interesting, we're gonna show you, you know, the wood blocks that I got last week, the black wood blocks. Well, uh, John, it's under the, it's inside from the shutter right now. I'll bring it in when the stream's off. It's, it's not getting rain on it anymore now that I have brought it back. So uh, whatever, but what we can do is we can turn off the audio for it to show. Which one is this? Testing, testing, good. 
Okay, thank you. The black wood blocks I showed you the other day, the carved wood blocks back from the Meiji era, it really wasn't a very good show and tell because they were black, you couldn't see what was going on, it was difficult for us all to see, I didn't even know what they were. I have since printed them and we can look at them and there is some cool, cool, interesting stuff on them. But before I do, one quick other one, one quick other one, just for one or two minutes. Yeah, the grid pattern blocks, yes. We have figured out basically what they are and what they're for. I say we. <laughs> Some of the staff members have uh, figured out what they're for. Okay, this box, this is not auction goods. This is from our carver, Kawasaki-san, in Kobe. And she was supposed to deliver this to me she was supposed to deliver this by Friday, and we were all scheduled that it would come by Friday and we would start working on the next step and blah, blah, blah. And she delivered it, sent it over over the weekend. So my schedule has been shot to shit, but whatever. Anyway, I'm happy to have it here. And what we have are, ah, in in like flame. It's a set of wood blocks. Does Kawasaki Sen have a website or social media? No, and she won't even send me freaking photographs. This is the thing, you know. I want Kawasaki Sen. Just show me a picture so we can tell people what's going on. They think Dave carved this stuff. I want to show, show, show. She says, no, 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 no. You've heard me say that before. No, 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 no. So, okay, okay, okay. Tell you what, get your friend to take a picture just of your hands carving this. No face, no nothing. We won't even mention Kobe. We won't even tell them anything. We won't even tell them your name. No, 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 no. So I'm beginning to suspect she doesn't exist. That there's some robot down in Kobe carves these things and I've been sucked in all the time and I think there's an actual real carver there. And I'm being hoodwinked. Whatever. <laughs> I mean, she's not. I don't want to misrepresent what she said. She's not paranoid about this. She just said, Dave, it's okay. I don't need to be up front. Just let me happily be a shokunin in the background. And interesting, actually, that is a true, much closer to a true shokunin's viewpoint. They don't want their name on this stuff. The, the older guys we use, Kubota-san, uh, Suditaro, the older craftsmen like this, they said, it doesn't matter. Well, our names don't need to go on there because they really think of themselves as just the guys in the background, like, like, uh, the, the New York Times, they print the newspaper, there's the press men in the basement. Do they need their name on the front page? They, what are you talking about? It's just our job to do it. So I get it. I get it. She is correct in this. She's correct. But in the modern world, you know, we like to whatever, you know. Okay, what this is, you've seen this. Oh, here we go with a black block again, huh? This is the key block. I think we're showing this here maybe for the first time. There we are, look at this. This is the key block for the print for uh, la, la, September. This is September's print in this year's series. And we have, you can see there are boats and we have a pier. And what these blocks have, let's have a look at them. Sky, not so interesting, sky. What happens to the sky, we'll see. And now you can see what's going on. Look at this, this is cool. You can see we have a storm raging against the pier. Now, of course, there's no color on any of these things yet. And how good is your imagination? Can you imagine seeing these blocks? Can you imagine what kind of color comes up on here? Some of these blocks, and I want you with the key block, it's printed by her. What we've done is when you're carving, I do this all the time, we carve, bit of bit, test, 
Once she's done the rough carving, she test prints it, looks at the print, and fixes, 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 prints again, fixes, fixes. So she didn't used to do this. She sent me the blocks black, back clean wood. And I said to her, how can you actually do that without testing it? She says, well, I didn't want to make a mess. Said, test it, test it. So she herself has tested the key block, but the color blocks don't need that. So what you're seeing here is this has been pasted down from the, from the transfer sheet, and the dark color you're seeing here was on the transfer sheet. And Dave did some of them. He printed the key block, he did his color. You've seen me do this and then pasted it down, and some I printed out from Jed's Photoshop. Let's just quickly, 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 quickly run through, because we have other stuff to look at here. You can get the idea. It's layering, layering. There's some depth in the waves. There's some depth in the town at the back. Another block has tone for the boats, part of the pier. You can see cutouts where the waves are coming. It's a super puzzle at this point. And from my point of view, when I was making prints by myself, this next stage, getting up to the printing bench, getting your pigments out, and turning this into a picture. Here we are, you can see again. There's waves, the waves are in positive and negative all together. There's trees in the back of the town, they block into the sky. You saw the sky block, it came behind here. The sky block came behind the town and the, the town is in silhouette against the sky. More highlights, depths, you can see building shapes. One last block, it's four sides. Oh, you can see what we've got here and here. I love carving these. I wish I had to get a chance to do this job. Love carving this. Rain blocks with something missing. And you can guess what that's gonna be, something missing on both of these blocks in the same place. So there we have it, the full block set, which is now gonna go upstairs, two rain blocks to show, so two rain blocks. It's Jed, you know, I've given him his rule. We've got this many pieces of wood, this many pieces of wood. He had one face left over. I'm like, just leave it, we'll use it. Just leave it, just leave it. No, it's not a plane, it's a light. It's a light in the town and it glows through. So we've got this town, it's dark, it's night. There's a storm flinging these boats around and there is one light shining in the background from the town. This block set now goes upstairs to the printer's room and away they go. Who's going to do this one for a test? I'm not sure. Daechan is still busy working on the second cat. I think this one will go to Ishikawa-san, no? I'm not really sure. Four blocks typical. Our, our current series, the Shinhanga series we're making right now, last year Japan Journey, and this year uh, we call it GJ. We're not supposed to call it GJ. It's a woodblock pilgrimage. We started this series with four pieces of wood. One had a key block, the back, and then color blocks would be seven. We just, we have not been able to do it at that level. We need a bit more depth and richness. The old Shin Hunger prints had, oh my God, dozens and dozens and dozens. So we are now, we've gradually pushed it, and we're now, for the most of these prints, we're looking at five pieces of wood. Okay, blocks, 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 blocks. We got the mystery of the grid and the numbers sorted out. All we had to do was read it. Here's one of the blocks we looked at the other day. This is black, oh, we're looking at it better. It's shiny because I just printed it. It's shiny. The deal was, it was a wood block which made something with, doesn't mean 10 impressions. Some of these have 12, 14, 16 impressions because one block can have once printed gradation, printed here from the side, printed again, lighter color, and also one block can have two zones on it. Okay, anyway, sidetrack, sidetrack, sidetrack. The deal was, we were thinking, is this a calendar? What is it? It's numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to 14 to uh, 21 to 28. And on the back side, it's got the same thing vertically, numbered one to five. This thing went up to a 35 to show it's seven by five, 35. And it said, here's the number, here's the type, whatever. It turns out there was a character which I didn't know, lots and lots of characters I didn't know. We have printed these things. We have printed these things, and this one right here 
tells the whole story. It says the spring, and this is an old character, it's no longer in use anymore, it's insect slash worm. This is the type, this is Daiichi group, and this is date the eggs hatched. This is from a silk or silk worm factory. It's probably not the place that's doing the weaving. This is way back at the beginning of the chain. These guys are feeding silkworms. And some, they've got these trays, 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 trays in a big rack, and they get it ready and the worms are in there, or whatever. I don't know anything about how the process works. And this is the sticker on the front of that thing. And they've put it, and this is the month day. So the hatching, it would be third month, second day. This label goes on there. And now you tell me what happens then on the first day or the second day or the third day. These are maybe the space they write it. It's maybe a 10 kilograms of food given or it's uh, 16 worms died. I have no idea what they would need to be tracking during the time. But this is the batch control sheet for a bunch of silkworms in one of these trays growing. And it's got the information, what type of worms these are and what day. And that's literally, it's egg sun. Sun is produced. The eggs produced day. This is cool. This is cool. And it gets a little bit better. It gets a little bit better. One of them, it's the same. They're all from the same company. It's just got numbers and no space to write anything. And it's the same thing. I know, produced eggs month day goes in this space. And again, there's room for numbers, number lot and group lot, whatever. This is the address of the place. It's in Ibaragi Camp. Cameron, we're, eating, we're here. Cameron visited the other day for doing the, the Tanoroshi, for doing the inventory and stuff. And we're having our pizza lunch, whatever. And then we showed this camera. He says, that's next door to me. That's just the next town over from where he lives. Uh, it's got Ibaragi Ken. Ken, it's the old way of writing Ken. We don't write it this way anymore. It's all simplified. And this is uh, something, something, Gun, and all. Uh, rural zone, like county for our American friends. And the, the other hint to this is the address label. One of the blocks was to print the packing label of these things. And this is fun. This is when they finish their product, they've wrapped it up, and they are sending it out. And it's dano todokesaki, it's where it's going to. And the address is here, you write, you write in the prefecture. It's going to Aomori Ken. Ken is already written to save you the trouble of writing it. You write Aomori Ken, Nani Nani Gun, Nani Machi or Mura. And this is cool. In those days, there was a Mura, villages, Machi town. There were cities, but they've pre-printed their form without the shape for city. So this company is shipping its goods out to rural areas, because the address label is pre-printed only with Gun, Mura, and Machi, which are only part of rural addresses. So you tell me, what is this? These guys, they're doing something with actual eggs that are being born, and they're doing something, something, something. So eggs are born, I guess the worms come out, they start eating leaves, whatever. I don't even know what happens next, but the product that these guys are shipping is either, it's cocoons they show, these silkworms eat the leaves, eat the leaves, and at some point they wrap themselves up. Then my guess, an un, 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 uneducated guess, is these guys bundle up the cocoons and out they go shipping to some rural area where there's other companies or individual people or whatever. They're boiling them up and actually making the silk, making, making the, the, the actual thread itself. Why that one would be in English and why there's no room to write something when all these other ones are in Japanese and there's room to write your notes, I don't know. This is one, two, three, four, five, six to 10, up to 35. And one of them does have a date on. The address label does have a date. Where's the block? I bought the blocks. I'm supposed to be showing you the blocks. Who cares about prints? This is the blocks. Here's the block. This is the address label. And it's got the date pre-printed. It says Meiji 40 blank. And Meiji went up to 43 or 44 when it finished, whatever. So this was already into Meiji. And they printed this label with the 4, 4, 0. And you would have written in 41, 2, 3, 4. If Meiji had continued on and on and on and on and on, at some point they would have had to take the 4 out and put a 5 in. And it's the same place. It's up in Ibaragi. 
old characters. Ken, I wouldn't have recognized this. That's the modern character for Ken Prefecture. This is fun, too. This threw me for a loop for a second. This is country. So the Torukisaki, the place it's going to, first the country name, and then in there, which prefecture, and I'm like, what? They're shipping to Canada, America, what? No, 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 no. In the old days, Kuni was the name for the region within Japan. We talk these days about Tohoku, or Shikoku, or Kinki, or whatever, the different areas of Japan as groups of prefectures, and there it was. So this would have been going to uh, Shikoku, Kochi, Ken, Nanigun, Nani, whatever. So these guys were shipping all over the country. But to see it listed at the top, where is this going, which country? Um, I don't think they were shipping to France. They're cool. I'm very, very, very happy to have these. And we are in no way going to plane these off and destroy them and use the wood. These wood blocks go into our, our little collection and they will become part of the uh, exhibitions that we do once we start doing exhibitions in our new back room and in the exhibition space that will be under construction up on the second floor over the next certain time period. So yeah, you too can have a look at these. You can see them next time you are here in Japan. This also, so it's the spring group. Maybe they had a different, this only happened once a year, or I don't have any idea what the time table, how this worked. But this is the spring um, insects, worms, the spring worms, shurui, which type, and then the numbered batch, and then the date of the egg hatching. And what would they write in these boxes? That's the next level of the mystery. I have no idea. Keep track of how many kilograms of leaves they've thrown inside would be my first guess. The first day there's five kilograms gone inside, a couple of memos. And this, I believe, would be the control sheet stuck on the side of that big rack of where all this stuff is happening. And of course, it's not the first of the month, second of the month, third of the month, it's the first day. The day that started is there. And from then on, it's each day rather than, you know, how many days. Maybe there's, I'm, I haven't been following the chat. If you guys have got this all figured out, maybe so, I don't know. Oh, Andy Sant, you, you know about this, silkworms? Yeah, there's a mis bit of a misconception saying silkworms eat mulberry, which is what Dave's paper is made of. It's actually in English, it's the same word. In Japanese, it's not the same plant. Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know. The mulberry that they use for feeding silkworms, they grow these things in a bushy form to get as many leaves as possible. The mulberry that they use to make paper, it sprouts up each year and they trim as many leaves off as they possible can. They trim branches before the leaves have a chance to grow. They want all the energy to go into the actual stem uh, and the bark. And I don't think it's even the same plant. It's the same group and we, in English we casually call them both mulberry. Cameron's got some links here, so, so, so. He's been up there. The video, I think that's the, the next video. He put a video up on Facebook last week uh, interviewing the guy with the laser, Kashiwagi-san, and Cameron has lots more video in preparation. He and I have been sort of semi-struggling, not struggling, but whatever. He thinks it's all sorted out. Dave is not sure what to do with it. The next video, he's got a bunch of video prepared on the mulberry production, cutting the stuff in the fields, boiling it up, stripping the bark off, getting it ready for the process going over to the paper maker. Anyway, there we go, there we go, there we go. I have got to now get to my next step. I am still now doing the final uh, no, run on our year-end bookkeeping. That's my job today. Okay, guys, I am going to be out of here. It's Monday morning. I will see you again in three more days, Thursday morning. During that time, I'll be doing bookkeeping. I'm going to Ome on Tuesday to do the inventory counting over there and say hello to my house for the first time in four months. And if the lady will do it, I'll ask her to chop my, my thatch. See you Thursday morning. Put that back to where it used to be. The rain seems to have quieted down. Yeah, look at that. The rain stopped. Okay, guys. Thanks very much. See you Thursday morning. Any news on silkworms, send it over. I'd love to learn how this works. See you then.